you'd like to set up a time to talk. So we'll go ahead and get started here in just one more minute. So anybody that's joined us since, just make sure that you're gonna go ahead and adjust to all panelists and attendees as we're going to get started. We're not gonna be able to hear you, but we're encouraging you to talk, have a good time, ask questions, uh, everything that you can. We want to make sure that you're participating, that this is a lot of fun tonight, and that you get something out of this. So please uh, be busy in the chat. I'm going to be your host, and I'm going to be here to help facilitate and take questions in the chat. But the star of the show here is going to be Mr. Jeremy Saliba. So I'm going to introduce a couple of people here tonight. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is introduce the star of the show. Uh, Jeremy Saliba is our online coordinator and instructor here. Uh, he received his BFA in illustration with an emphasis in 2D animation from Academy of Art University here in 2003. Later, he joined the Academy as a part-time instructor in 2007, spearheading new curriculum that integrated the Wacom Cintiq technology and became an online curriculum coordinator for the School of Visual Development in 2014. Jeremy is also a cover artist for Dynamite Entertainment and has worked as the art director for the graphic novel Ultra Sylvania. Previously, he worked as a digital artist, concept artist, and character designer for clients, including NVIDIA, graphics, and Tor Books. Currently, he's working on various visual development projects for Image Comics and is creating Lucas Film licensed Star Wars artwork. So, a lot of cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't want to give anything away tonight, but we will probably be doing some, uh, some digital painting on things that you're familiar with. Also, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Nicholas Villarreal. Some of you probably already know Nicholas. He's the director of our visual development and 2D animation schools here. Uh, Nicholas graduated with honors from the master's program at the Academy of Art University here back in 2002. He's worked as a traditional animator, character designer, sculptor, and visual development artist for the film and video game companies, including Walt Disney Studios, Sony Computer Entertainment, Jim Henson Studios, Sega, Digital Domain, Real FX, and Amazon Studios. He's given presentations and screened his films at Pixar Animation Studios, DreamWorks uh, Animation, Blue Sky Studios, the Sydney Opera House, and several universities in South America and Europe. So my name is Hector Verdugo. I'm going to be your host tonight. You're going to see me in the chat. Please ask as many questions as you can. Should be a lot of fun here. I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas to say a few words before we get started. See you all in the chat. Thank you so much, Hector for those wonderful introductions. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think you're going to love this guest that we have today. I'm going to speak only for a few seconds because I know you guys are here to see Jeremy. I'm here to see Jeremy, too, um, and his work. What I would like to say is that Jeremy is one of the most talented individuals that I know and hardworking. He has been working very hard for the last 20 years, 15, probably. He has been working for Lucas Films as well as doing his own comic books and working as character designer and visitor artist for a couple of studios. Uh, he told me what he's going to do. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you. So without any, any uh, further ado, Mr. Jeremy Saldiva. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, everybody. I am the aforementioned uh, Jeremy Saliba, and uh, I'm looking forward to kind of chatting with you, answering questions, and doing a little digital painting for you guys and kind of talking about my process and the process that uh, we generally not only teach but use when we work professionally, and that is uh, a tried and true well-tested way to kind of approach this this kind of work. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about as well my journey. I'm a, I was a graduate from the Academy of Arts uh, a long time ago. I wrote my brontosaurus to Photoshop class um, uh, back when I went because it was a while back, um, but uh, it's been uh, an incredible journey ever since then uh, covering a lot of different kind of, you know, uh, ups and downs and, and learning to kind of navigate my way through world and learn to make a living being an artist. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is kind of start off with just sketching and talking. It's gonna be more fun, I think, to watch some sketching going on while I kind of chat or answer questions or anything like that. So I'm gonna start my screen share and um, kind of introduce you to what I'll be doing before I start really getting going on chatting. As uh, anyone who knows me can tell you, I, uh, I like to talk, so you never know. Uh, I wanna make sure we get some baselines here so you guys know what's going on before I go. So I'm gonna share my screen. And it's just my desktop here. And you can see that, um, well, first of all, I have a Spider-Man background, so I'm a nerd just like you. Um, and I'm gonna be using Photoshop uh, for working uh, tonight. Um, 
the uh, uh, it's, it's very common for uh, beginners to be really excited and, and curious and have lots of questions about the software that we use um, and uh, some of those tools. And uh, uh, there's a lot of different options out there these days. Um, uh, a lot of, I mean, from the digital drawing software side of it, there's Photoshop, which is one of the big stars of the show. Uh, Procreate's coming up fast that people use on iPads. Um, and uh, uh, other programs like Clip Studio Art uh, and a few like that can be amazingly uh, strong as well. Um, we tend to, I learned on Photoshop, the industry standard is still Photoshop. Um, there's lots of workarounds and it's, it's, it's changing up a little bit, but there are things that Photoshop can still do that other programs just can't yet, or at least not quite as fast um, when it comes to like image processing and image adjustments. So um, we tend to still make sure that you guys know Photoshop and uh, most studios still want that as a, as a main uh, uh, element of your education where you uh, are starting to go to these places and apply. Um, but it almost, the, the, it doesn't matter that much though. I mean, Photoshop plugs into other parts of the production pipeline because you have, it has editing programs, Adobe, like, like After Effects and Premiere. And so the assets from Photoshop can plug directly in. So studios like that. But the methods that I'm gonna be using tonight primarily are ones that I learned traditionally. And that's like, that's, that's really the key ingredient to all this is learning how to draw and paint uh, and, and create imagery um, in, a, in the rawest sense possible. So that way, when you, whatever software you get in your hands, you can apply what you know and the way you know it without having to really worry about the ins and outs of the software. Um, honestly, uh, you can give me a stick and tell me to go outside and start doing character designs. And um, I, would, I, would, I would enjoy the challenge. It would be fun because I know how to work uh, despite whatever software I might be using or, or you know, the nuance of the digital tools. Um, some of our top graduates out there, we have, we have a lot of graduates that are kind of becoming legends in the industry these days, um, especially in the world of visual development. And whenever they're tracked down and asked, you know, what about your education do you attribute to, um, uh, uh, you know, being part of so successful in understanding art so well so fast, they always say it's the traditional stuff that sets it apart. Um, and getting a foundations in, you know, uh, traditional drawing and painting um, makes it so that you understand uh, uh, what the tools are trying to do digitally, as well as, um, you know, gives you a, 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 a way to approach this stuff, even again, without necessarily being an expert in the software. Um, so when it comes to things like brushes, um, I tend to stay pretty standard on most types of brushes. Um, I am the hardware, I'm working on a Cintiq, which is a computer screen that uh, I can draw and sketch on um, directly, uh, draw, draw on the screen, similar to what you might do with an iPad and an Apple Pencil. Um, this hooks up to my desktop computer. There are many options for different types of screens out there these days though. So um, that's good too. It becomes kind of like, it was the first game in town. And so it's considered by many to be the best, but there are a lot of alternatives that aren't as expensive that work just as well. So I kind of did a little sketch um, uh, before we started tonight and I figured I would do Darth Vader because I've done Darth Vader uh, a few times uh, these days already uh, professionally. And so I know a little bit about how to go about making the Darth Vader painting and um, stick with what you know, right? So uh, just like, again, any other method, uh, a great way to start out is by making a thumbnail sketch, going in and doing a quick basic block in of your idea to see if it's gonna work or not. In digital development, we oftentimes uh, encourage, well, a big part of the process is doing multiple sketches and choosing the best one. Um, but I'm kind of doing this for fun tonight. So when you're doing it for fun, you can afford to be a little bit more artsy fartsy. I get out my French beret and, you know, the long of red halter and I speak with the accent and I, I, I hold my uh, stylus way out like a brush. I'm kidding. Mostly. So I did a quick sketch just to kind of get an idea going of what I want to do with Art Vader. I figured I'd keep it relatively simple. Um, in case uh, there was, you know, uh, we have an hour and who knows how far we'll get. Um, I do have another screen open that you can't see. You can, if you can see me at all, uh, I just lit up a little bit because I also have reference up. Another big important part of being a good artist is knowing how to use reference. And by that, I mean, looking up, you know, information about the thing you're going to be drawing so you draw it accurately. There's a really weird inverse proportionate relationship between beginners and professionals, where beginners use reference the least and professionals use it the most. You'd think it'd be the other way around, but that's kind of the way it works out. So I have some images of Darth Vader up to remind me. I even have one of my fancy little Darth Vader action figures here because these make great reference. You can put lights on and do whatever you want. So 
uh, it's also a great excuse to tell my wife and children that I still need to have toys uh, from occasion. Dad needs to get a new toy, guys. Why? It's for work. It's for work. I don't want to get these toys. I have to. So I'm just going to kind of uh, solidify the sketch here of Darth Vader. Um, obviously, it's a real loose, quick kind of motion that I've done um, to kind of generate some shapes. And so the next step here is going to be establishing the silhouette more clearly, blocking in the overall shape and outline of this. Um, once you've created a good silhouette shape, um, uh, painting and drawing after that's a lot easier, um, especially again, when you're doing like kind of a painting, it's a lot easier to know where the bullseye is when you can see it, right? So we kind of set up these ideas ahead of time. Otherwise it's like trying to throw darts in the dark and I won't know where to go. So I'm gonna solidify this and kind of chat a little bit about, uh, uh, I guess what was going on when I went to school and uh, what I did since then. Is there any questions, by the way, I could field in the meantime that are coming up about anything in particular or? Uh, one of the, I mean, there's been a couple of questions, but mm -hmm. I'll start currently. So uh, is there any tip to get the proportions right when drawing figures? Uh, that's an excellent question. And for me, uh, the tip was lots of practice. Um, the, uh, there's, there's knowledge that goes into it. Uh, and Andrew Loomis is kind of considered one of our gods of drawing and illustration who really, really quickly and efficiently like a hundred years ago set down the standards by which um, you can easily judge proportions and we use the head as a unit of measurement because the head doesn't change size as much as other parts of the body. Even when you're born as a baby, uh, your head's about one third of the side of your, size of your body. And as you grow, your head grows a little, but your body grows a lot. And so uh, to make a character feel taller or shorter or judging you know, the right proportions, um, we use the head as the unit of metrics, it's pretty much the same. A tall person is you know, eight, maybe nine heads tall. Um, and a shorter person, I'm five seven. So I'm probably, I would say maybe five heads tall, maybe six. Um, it depends, I also have a, a large head. So it's an unfortunate combination. But, um, uh, uh, and then you can kind of go down from there, you know, and so that keeping the head size the same, but making the body bigger or smaller lets you know that the character's not just being closer if you're drawing it bigger, if the head size is smaller. It really helps, even without reference, establish that kind of stuff. Um, and then I did a lot of figure drawing classes. So you learn these things academically um, and you study them, and then it, but that's different than actually implementing them. Uh, the moving of your hand it's almost an athletic performance. I mean, never confuse me with someone with any athletic talent or skill. I can, I can throw a spiral. I got that much, um, but that's about all I can do physically. Um, uh, but there's a certain kind of muscle memory and a, a learned kind of movement system you have to generate over practice. It's like learning to play the drums, learning to throw a pitch. Um, there's no other way other than practicing. So a lot of figure drawing classes, which end up being really cool and fun. Meet a lot of people and do a lot of cool drawings. You know, a uh, million dollar question here mm -hmm. uh, that came in and it was from Davina out there. Mm -hmm. How often do you practice and how do you practice efficiently? Uh, and yeah, that is a very good question. Um, the uh, practicing every day is fundamentally key to keeping your skills sharp. Um, you can always, you know, take breaks. There's times where we go on vacation. There's times where we do things. But generally speaking, uh, to keep things flowing and keep things going well, um, practicing every day. One of the things that we'll kind of, that I in particular talk about in the lectures of my classes is how much studio work will be different. Um, everyone, we're all kind of gearing towards working in our, especially in visual development, working towards a studio, an animation studio, a game studio, a live action studio. And they do a lot of, like when we do character design, sometimes they want you to use the fastest ways possible. And so you can copy and paste one drawing of a figure and then try different costume designs on them to see which one's gonna be the best one. And, you know, the copy and paste method is great. It's fast and it's efficient, but you're drawing less. You're getting less practice. Um, but they're not as concerned about that as they are getting a good final product in. So that's why a lot of, so then after, even after work, when you get the dream job at the studio, you go home and you do some sketching to make sure. But the hope is that it's still enjoyable too. That's still fun. And that's, especially if you're off the clock, you can just sketch the things you like to sketch. And my favorite part about going to art school was studying this academic stuff and then going home and applying it to the things that I wanted to do. So I was learning anatomy and learning how to light and shadow things really well and, and blend and shade. So then I go home and do that with like the Hulk. So 
So again, I'm kind of blocking in some silhouette shapes and um, I'm getting things pretty dark. Darth Vader's all pretty much a black figure. Um, he is, speaking of proportions, relatively tall. He's supposed to be uh, two meters tall um, in the Star Wars universe. And I uh, obviously am from the US, so I don't know what meters are, uh, <laughs> but that's what, like seven feet tall, close to it. So his head size. Now it's funny when I do the Lucasfilm Ice and stuff, I'm excited tonight that this isn't like for work because I like to make Darth Vader's head a little smaller because the guy who played him in the suit was a guy named David Prowse and he was a big, big guy. He's a big weightlifter, but the helmet's so big, you couldn't tell how tall Darth Vader was sometimes. He didn't look that crazy tall unless he was next to somebody. So I like to kind of push it and make the head a little bit smaller to make him seem like the monster that he is. And uh, he, uh, uh, I'm not going to get anyone to tell me to change it tonight. That's fine. Lucasfilm gets very, they're very specific. Nope, head's too big. Head's too small. Change it. Whenever I submit work to them. I, uh, so yeah, I graduated in 2003 and I was a, I got a degree in illustration with an emphasis in 2D animation. I wanted to be a 2D animator and work at studios like Disney and do 2D hand-drawn animation. I fell in love with it. I started going to the Academy to be a digital artist. Uh, that was my major. I didn't know what that meant in the 1990s when I started, but I kind of wanted to work at ILM and work on special effects. And I was taking the foundation classes at the school. And the nice thing about that is that I was able to, um, practice all the foundation classes are pretty much you, you go through the same course in the first year or so where you're taking you know basic drawing classes and um elements like that and over that time as i was taking those classes i realized you know the digital art majors at that time weren't so focused on drawing and i wanted to draw it was a big love of mine and i figured if i'm going to art school i'm going to learn to draw so i switched to 2d animation because it had a lot of animation software ideas in it as well as um uh, classes in it as well as uh, traditional ones but when I graduated in 2003, uh, traditional animation was going away. Uh, the studios were moving hard into 3D animation. Um, Pixar obviously was the, you know, the big game in town. Disney was still learning how to do things well in 3D. And uh, uh, PDI, uh, DreamWorks was doing their thing as well. So, and I wasn't so much a 3D guy, so I figured I'll learn to pivot so I can keep drawing and painting for a living and started looking into this new thing that was called concept art, visual development. And uh, uh, so I had to kind of pivot. And for me, actually, I don't, it's interesting because my journey had some had some rough spots here and there. Um, and I I tell the story to students when we're in classes, and they almost are always they always tell me they're relieved to hear that it wasn't super smooth and easy for me. Um, I took a while to go through college. I, I went to uh, community college for a while to figure out what I wanted to do. I was told, "Don't be an artist. Uh, you can't make a living being an artist. It's really hard. It's hard to make money." And my family was meeting well, but so I tried to do other things for a while and realized I'm not gonna be happy doing anything else. I'll just be poor, I guess, and, and be happy uh, working in visual development or in art. Turns out uh, I picked the right school because I learned what I needed to learn to uh, do what I wanted to do. Um, but I also, uh, uh, I got married, my wife wanted to go back to school. So I ended up taking a second job, like a day job for a while and still trying to just practice and reapply my lessons on what I learned in school. And I kept getting better. And so it took a year or two for me uh, uh, to get things out to get together for myself uh, at a certain point after I got out. And uh, then I started kind of just going for like simple kind of work around the area and getting myself out there, going back around and talking to my friends from school. Networking at school was incredibly important. It, uh, uh, me making friends and then a lot of them were successful, which, which was tough at times. Um, while I was struggling to see them, they all were getting jobs at studios and um, I was still kind of working day jobs and, and getting things set up for myself. but. Ultimately, that was great. And it was, um, I knew Nicholas from those days and he was working at a studio and he'd been seeing some of my more recent work and how much I'd developed. And so uh, he had said, hey, we need another uh, artist for another animated short we're working on. Can you, are you available? And uh, I said, I had to play it cool, right? Oh, let me check my schedule. Let me check my planner. I've got, my, yes, I'm available. Um, and so I started doing some work uh, for them. I did little things like there was comic books in the Bay Area at the time, some comic companies and they needed me to, do coloring, which is a, you know, a nice way to kind of get started on stuff. Um, and that was kind of the big, I mean, once you get your first job, it's all a lot easier from there. There's still a couple of, you know, tough spots here and there where there might be a, you know, a, a drought, a gap of something. Um, but after that, I mean, I made friends and made contacts and got more work for my portfolio doing that job and started earning a reputation. That was the other key thing is that there's no software that makes it that so that you can make sure to be on time and hit your deadlines and be like easy to work with and take feedback well and 
that was all stuff that I had to get trained to do at school. And, but doing all that was a big part of me being able to develop a career as well. Um, we always joke, have to, it's, it's, it's true. We'll, we'll kind of joke when we talk about it, but the true the fact of the matter is you need, there's, you need, there's three reasons why you can be successful. One is um, if you're really good. Another one is if you're really fast. And another one is if you're easy to work with, or I just call it being cool. <laughs> Um, so those are the, those are the three things that can help you, uh, get work. And if you get any two out of those, uh, you're good. If you're good and you're fast, but you're kind of a jerk, eh, they'll probably still hire you. Um, if you're, if you're really fast, but your work's kind of still loose, but you're also great to work with, they need you. And if you're really, really good, sometimes take a little longer, but you're easy to work with. They want you there. So, um, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> which ones am i um i'm still i don't know i'm still working on it i'll let you guys know uh um, but hey so mm -hmm. i was gonna tell you there's been several questions about transitioning from paper to digital mm -hmm. so i've i've had several students ask very similar questions awesome, awesome. Uh, i see Singh out there he's a repeat customer he came here last week thanks for being here uh so the essence of the question is you know i've been drawing on paper uh, I'm looking to go digital. Like, what advice can you give me? What are some of the differences, et cetera, et cetera? But what's that transition like from 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 paper to digital? Uh, good question. When I first transitioned, um, it was a lot harder. There were no screens to draw on of any kind. So we had I had what was called a Graphire tablet that I got from my computer, and I had new Photoshop from doing photo photographic Photoshop assignments and trying art a little bit. It was still new, but my Graphire tablet was a four inch by five inch tablet, and at that time, it was all about hand-eye coordination to look at a screen and draw down here and, and line it up. Um, so it was different. But these days, it's obviously a lot more user-friendly. You've got a lot of options. Um, so uh, ultimately, the programs are kind of designed to make it as seamless as possible. There is still a difference. Um, and we get a lot of students who are working traditionally really well. And studios don't care that much what medium you're using as long as you're coughing up the goods as long as you're coming up with cool character designs and hitting your deadlines no one's that you don't ever hear what software did you use in the studio unless they need to re recreate the same effect you made or something like that um so what i also recommend doing is because sometimes students will try real hard to go into digital and it's not as strong as their traditional stuff and so they need that transitional turnover like you're describing like you're asking about and the the best way to do it is in my opinion is to draw traditional and then scan it um, you can photograph it, but um, ultimately uh, scanning is the most superior foolproof way to get a, a clean image uh, of your drawing from paper into the computer. And um, I can show you an example real quick of a drawing that I did to kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, and once you sketch some, uh, scan something in, so here's a drawing I did of Dr. Strange. And um, it's, I think I drew this digitally, if I remember correctly, but um, uh, it's all just one flat JPEG here. So that's what you would get if you scanned it. You get the white paper as part of your uh, document. And so ultimately, you know, if you make a new layer in Photoshop to paint like on top of, it's covering up the line work. And I wouldn't want that for this painting. I'd want to keep the line work in at least for a while. So I could um, continue to, uh, you know, block in basic colors and shapes for different areas on Dr. Strange and the paint covering up is a, a bummer. So all programs have the same kind of baseline operational procedure. And what you do is you can double click on this background layer, which that background has a padlock on it. It's, it's kind of, it has weird properties. It's a background layer. It just does, it behaves differently than normal ones do. So when you double click on it, it makes a regular layer. Now I can make a new layer below it. Now, if I paint below it still, I can't see because the white is in front of it. So we change the layer blend mode. And again, you can do this in Procreate, Clip Studio. It's the same across every image processing program that's out there. Um, you can set it to multiply mode and multiply makes the white pixels transparent. So now I can paint, oops, I'm painting the wrong layer. <laughs> uh, get used to that if you get into this. Um, uh, now I can paint underneath it and uh, keep the line work intact. So I, I recommend this method because um, Painting is, a, is not as precise necessarily it can be, but um, painting, once you have a drawing in place already, it's obviously, I mean, we've all done coloring books, you know, as little kids, obviously it's kind of like that. And so then you're, you're again, building up that hand-eye coordination 
uh, and that that interface kind of muscle memory of what it's like to paint in whatever given hardware slash software you're messing with uh, when you're ready to transition. Hey, Jeremy. Um, yeah. Is there any way to zoom in or enlarge the image so we can see a little bit more of the detail? Sure. Yeah, because there's so much great detail in that artwork and we're sure. seeing it from zoomed out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that I do too, for whatever it's worth, I'm just kind of like slapping some color on here. But one of the things that I do is I, I don't work on a white background. Um, in tradition, I got, and I got this from working traditionally, um, when you do an oil painting, they have you come in and what's called tint your canvas. You don't paint a blank white canvas. You go in and you lay a base of abstract colors, just kind of have fun and use browns and oranges or whatever. There's lots of different ideas of why you might do it, but you're going to cover it up. And the idea is that you won't have any white left over if you miss a spot. It just looks more finished. It helps you make it finished quicker. But also on a screen, one of the things about working at a desk is ergonomics and keeping your health in check. You really have to keep that and awareness of it. And with computers, the other thing is eye strain. Um, if any of you are like me, you're up sometimes late at night working on your artwork and it's dark. Like a lot of people when they go start working on screens, they turn off every light in the room and that's the only one on, which isn't great for your eyes. Um, and if it's a white screen, that's, that creates a lot of eye strain staring at a light bulb. So I will often um, make my whole canvas a little bit, uh, just even a, uh, some sort of tint color to work on in general. So I don't have to deal with that. Um, there were some, I remember recently reading a few years ago about a lot of storyboard artists that had begun suffering some retinal detachment and uh, which was a, a serious eye condition. And um, they blamed working digital. And I thought to myself, no, 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 I know what's going on. They're probably drawing on white backgrounds. We need to, I need to educate all the artists that I come across that, you know, that way leads, leads trouble. So you can see, I can paint underneath my line work layer. Here's the layer underneath. And you know you can move those things around. You paint digitally, um, and that's I mean that's the the reason why people end up going digital isn't because it looks better. It's because of all the the you know the ways you can quickly make changes. That's really the key element. Is you can make changes really really fast. There's no waiting for paint to dry. There are some drawbacks. You know one of the drawbacks being that it doesn't look sometimes very traditional. You have to work harder to make digital artwork look more convincingly like artistic. Um, and a lot of people do and they get, you know, whatever brushes, they try different things to, you know, all in the pursuit of it. And, but just like regular, I mean, when you talk about, you know, custom brushes in Photoshop, um, the, the brushes themselves are kind of art specific. You know, there's no magic bullet. There's no way to learn how to paint in a day. Uh, it takes practice, again, just like drawing, just like drumming, just like, you know, learning how to throw a pitch. Um, and the uh, the brushes that you end up using end up becoming, and the methods that you used to paint, there's no one method for painting either. I'm What I'm kind of doing through these two pieces that I'm kind of working on is what's known as a build method. I kind of work from dark to light, which is common when you learn how to paint with oils or acrylics. Um, there's what's also what's called a build method which is what people who use pencils, pen and ink, watercolor, they start with a white page of paper and they, you know, add dark and keep building up the darks. So um, everyone has their own kind of journey as far as like what, you know, what tools they like, what methods they like, you know, everyone's different. You have to experiment and try those different things. And so we have assignments set up so you can do fun projects and experiment with those different types of uh, techniques both traditional and digital. And when that happens, um, you start to realize where your preferences are, where you're, where you, how you make the best artwork. And then it gets really relaxing because you start realizing not only what your process is, but how long it takes you. And that's a way less panicky than in the beginning when you're like, ah, oh, this is the first time I've tried this. I don't know how long it's gonna take. Um, so we talk a lot about time management in the intro classes. Um, I've built that into our curriculum because it's a really important skill with art. Um, but, uh, and the same thing goes for like traditional brush or uh, custom brushes and things like that. I don't know if anyone here has ever watched a Bob Ross show, Bob Ross painting, but he had a bunch of custom brushes too. He had, all, he had a huge jar, right? Full of all these old gnarled brushes and he wasn't painting individual leaves on trees. He was grabbing that brush and like stamping it on the canvas and it made like a spattery kind of texture that looked like pine needles or whatever on a branch. And, um, you know, it's the same. 
the, the custom brushes aren't new. They've been around for hundreds of years. Um, for some reason, when we make them digital, people go, oh, what brush are you using? <laughs> um, but uh, it's the same techniques that have been around for literally hundreds of years. And you're gonna find ones. You're gonna find ones that some people make, they go, oh, this is my favorite brush. I use it, I never, I've never, I've made every good painting I've ever done with it. And it won't work for you. It's just different. It handles in a way that your brain doesn't like. Um, I tend to stick with pretty basic ones for the most part. I rarely get too fancy with brushes because I'm, you know, more traditional. We had a couple students that asked for tips. Uh, one of them was saying, can I get some tips on line work? And then uh, another million dollar question was, uh, can you give us some tips on time management? Mm, yes. Um, line work, uh, uh, there's a lot of things to think about with line work. I mean, there's a certain level of precision that's required for line work, which comes from practice. The other thing is um, if you, you want line quality, line quality means kind of a variation of line. If you, all of your line is exact same width all throughout your drawing, it can create a feeling of kind of stale, kind of robotic quality to it which is a little bit less attractive. And you can really put a lot of emphasis, even with a slight variation on how thick or thin your lines are. I'm not a very instinctive artist. I tend to need to think about my art. I can't just sit down and do a cool painting just at the drop of a hat. Um, I'm a little bit more analytical than that. And so um, I, uh, uh, I do the same thing with my line quality. I had a, I had a hard time learning line quality um, in school. It, it, it escaped me for a while. It was a real big struggle for me. And I eventually, um, uh, kind of started developing a system where I, I would realize, okay, well, here's what I'll do. I will have thicker lines on the underside of things and thinner lines on the above side, which kind of simulates like lighting. If you have thicker lines on the bottom of, you know, like I do down here, for example, and thinner lines up top on, on areas, um, it almost feels like, you know, it's darker shadowy spots and it creates like a pleasing arrangement. So you can strategize that kind of stuff too. But um, you know, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a bit of trial and error as well. And that's, that's a tough part for students is, is figuring out like what works for them. Students, it's hard. It's hard drawing and painting. It's hard doing, you know, homework assignments you're drawing and then bringing it into a class and everyone look at it. And people tend to kind of want to only succeed. The, 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 the embarrassment of failure is, is something that is hard to kind of realize you don't need to have. And uh, you do eventually. You realize it's all good and you're all learning to come to, you know, same kind of goals together. Um, but it's trial and error. You have to fail. You have to in order to figure out what works for you and what doesn't. Now, as far as time management goes, the key is there's discipline involved in that as well. I mean, a lot of this is going to require some level of discipline. That's pretty much anything in life that's worth pursuing kind of ends up having that as a, as a you know, side effect, um, a requirement. And so, for example, I had to learn those lessons hard. I mean, with, and when I was a student, I just didn't sleep. <laughs> um, but I was in my 20s and could afford it. Uh, you know, you can go without some, some of us can go without sleep a little bit more when you're younger, at least. Um, and then I started working professionally, you know, I really had to get my stuff together. And so there was one time, for example, I got, I was working for an international company, European company doing storyboards. And they called me one Saturday and they said, we, we want four storyboard panels, but like more developed with paint and like a little bit of like coloring and a little bit of lighting in it. We need them in eight hours. Can you do it? And I said, okay, they paid in euros and the exchange rate was really good at that point. So I said, sure, I can do it. So I had eight hours to do four of those uh, drawings. So I did the math. That means I had two hours per, per, per storyboard panel. So what I did was, is I set a stopwatch and put it next to my desk. And I set it for, uh, I think it was like an hour and a half. And so I would, and I would draw and draw and draw and the hour half was up, I stopped, I put it aside, started the next one, set a timer for an hour and a half, draw, 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 but I have that remainder of time. It was an hour and a half, an hour 45. And, um, so at the end, I had like a little over an hour, hour and a half to kind of look at all four of them together and try to make sure they were all at the same level and give them all one big less, less pass of polish first before I set it off. So it's stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of students don't necessarily, you know, I'll assign an assignment where I say, do, you know, 10 compositional studies, do 10, you know, really simple uh, drawings where you're just kind of blocking in like where the character will be and where the, you know, a mountain will be or a building will be something simple. And beginners you know like all of us will wait till the night before and um you know it's it's late and they go oh, i'll just bust out those sketches sound easy and uh, they start drawing them and they realize after one drawing it's been you know an hour and they have i assigned 10 <laughs> so they got nine hours left and it's already like midnight so starting a little bit early and getting a sense of how long it takes you and then but also setting that timer 
uh, and turning it off and moving on to the next one without getting caught up and doing spending one hour on one thumbnail drawing. So you can see that I'm just gonna keep this one basic and then I'll go back to Darth and kind of speed him up a little bit. But you can really, you know, kind of, I, I again, I block in the silhouette shapes. Now this is another like strategic, strategic move because once I block in the silhouette, you can like lock in on pixels that are uh, uh, there. So if I turn off the other layers, you can see that that checkerboard pattern means that that layer is transparent. There's nothing there around those pixels. And so if I hit this button here, this little uh, checker button, it's called lock, it's called lock transparent pixels. So now I can't paint outside of um, this, what I've done. And my, I, I have a loose silhouette here. But so now as I go and paint this, if I paint directly on this, I did the hard work by blocking in a solid silhouette. Now I can just kind of go for it. So like even now, if I want to block in like a skin tone, maybe warm this up a little bit. So here I'm picking skin tones based on, again, experience and knowledge of doing this stuff a lot, um, knowing he's a Caucasian character, knowing what kind of, I'm gonna go a little bit more shadow with this. And if I do that, I might actually go a little bit cooler with it. Um, a little darker still. So I'm, I'm experimenting, right? And I'm gonna do this right here. There we, and that's not bad, but I can see going a little bit cooler for the shadow color. Hey, Jeremy, uh, while you're yeah, coloring yeah. here and uh, teaching, this is a common thing I get uh, every workshop, you know, and I'm doing these every single week and it's about roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've, I've had people ask this and I, one person in the chat asked it and I know it's going to come up later in the chat if I don't ask it. So uh, how do you deal with, you know, mental roadblocks, uh, art, art blocks, uh, mm -hmm. want to call it? I mean, we all call it something different, but basically... Mm -hmm. What are some of your exercises, best practices to get through those creative blocks? Uh, there's, oh, we, we, we actually had a, a question about this in a recent town hall meeting where we, you know, at least once a semester, we will, uh, you know, meet with students uh, in person or virtually. Um, and as we've been doing it exclusively lately, and um, uh, someone asked that, and we all had our own unique answers. Um, Nicholas's first one was take a walk, uh, get outside, take a walk, get your mind off it. Um, uh, really kind of set it down and put it aside. I, sometimes when you're under the gun, that's hard to do, but it ends up being more productive and faster to take, get up and step away. We have this tendency as artists to just bash our heads. Why isn't it working right? I'm a failure oh, and just keep trying harder. And that sometimes that's the path of most resistance is to try harder as opposed to going around the obstacle. Um, sometimes doing a different piece of artwork is really good because you know it gets the juices flowing, doing something that so that's my thing is that I will, um, I will do basically the art equivalent of comfort food. Um, so instead of going to eat, you know, mashed potatoes and hamburgers or whatever pizza, um, I will do a screen cap painting. So an example being like, here is a, a screen capture from a movie called Dunkirk, which I thought was really beautiful and a really good composition. And let's see here, I have a screen capture painting that I did of it right here. I did like a black and white screen capture painting of it. And so doing projects like this, for me is fun and relaxing because I'm not making any choices. Uh, I'm looking at someone else's amazing artwork and uh, kind of like using that as a basis to draw with. So I can turn my brain off to a certain degree and just block in and kind of copy, but I'll abbreviate or I'll try some technique that I've been thinking about trying just to kind of shake it up or just sit and listen to music and, and do something that I know is fun and there's no pressure. And that'll get those juices flowing in a way where I'm like, okay, I got it. And again, getting my mind off the actual project I was doing. Um, I know a lot of professional artists who their whole thing is to um, have multiple projects going at once. They have at least three jobs that they've taken on freelance at any given time, or that they're setting up at a studio. So they can work on one for a couple hours. And then even if it's going well or not, shift, work on another one for a couple hours, shift and keep rotating through them so they don't get that block. Um, they may find that works for them. So there's, there's techniques and they're usually different for everybody. So I'm still staying kind of loose here. There's a lot of detail in this guy that I kind of block in, um, but I'm gonna kind of just do a little bit of render pass on this guy so you can see, I keep calling Dr. Strange this guy. Hopefully he doesn't curse me. He might not like that. So you see here, and again, this is something, you know, you learn kind of working traditionally, the, the whites of the eyes aren't actually white. 
a big part of learning to draw and be an artist in any capacity is learning how to get really observant, being more observant than uh, you would ever think you'd have to be. Um, so a basic block in here. And now the idea is to um, apply some light, turn the light on. So again, I paint kind of dark to light. So these are kind of like my shadow layers and I might even go through and I can make a change real quick if I want. Um, I can darken it up a little bit. Um, and I can do that again later if I keep things separate. And so now I'll start with the face. Sure, why not? That'll be fun. Um, and so I'm gonna use a brush that has a pressure sensitivity to it. So it mimics a traditional feel a little bit more. Uh, and so you can see like if I you know push harder, more paint comes out. If I push lighter, less paint comes out. Um, this is so I can kind of intuitively you know, build. So a big part of uh, being able to paint light is studying light and understanding light. What's a good angle? What's the best angle for the light on this character? Is it going to be, you know, from this angle, from that angle, from this one, from the front, uh, from behind, maybe, you know, uh, a little bit more, you know, what's, what's the best arrangement? I'm just going to go above and in front, kind of a boring basic one, but it's kind of symmetrical, the drawing, it's kind of a power move he's doing here. So um, I, uh, you know, and it's, it's kind of easy. It's a, it's a standardized formulaic way. Um, I learned how to paint faces by drawing mm, about a thousand of them and, and rendering them and taking heads and hands drawing classes. And the first few were terrible and I was embarrassed and I was upset that I wasn't good when some of the class students in my class were good. I was not, I had to learn. Um, and uh, uh, I kept, but I'm stubborn and I'm kind of competitive. You know, I don't want people to learn. I would learn to paint. I could do it. So uh, I know that basically there's certain planes that are facing more upward and certain planes that are facing more downward where our plane changes. And I, all the faces are kind of the same layout. You know, you've got the forehead, which is kind of round. You've got a brow ridge and his is raised right now. And I'm kind of zoomed in and I'm working kind of loose. And the secret is, I mean, really good artists don't necessarily have to zoom in. I'm still working on it. Um, but it's kind of, and I'm starting with a detail which is usually not what we do. And I have my drawing here where I set up some guidelines. I had some lines for his cheekbones and where they turn a corner around the face. Um, so I kind of set myself up for success to know where, like, where to paint things. So I'm just painting where light would hit those surfaces that are most facing where I'm imagining my light source to be a little bit in front and above. Um, so again, you know, on the hands here, just the top, I mean, it, the hands are kind of small in this painting. And you want to work loose and generally across the whole thing. I wouldn't want to sit here and develop just the face to immaculate detail over time because it, I'm, I, I, who knows? Like, especially if we're working at a studio, this is how I kind of think. This is my mentality working uh, in, in, for co in concept art. You never know what level of finish is going to be enough for the production. Um, uh, sometimes they want it super rendered and polished. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes enough is perfect to send to another department to use as, as you know, a ground uh, a blueprint for a scene or for a character. And so if I work evenly across the whole thing and apply light, they might come by and look and go, good, take it, that's great. Or they might go, you know, this is turning out really well, why don't you keep developing it? Because you might use this as promotional art or something like that. But really concept art is not, most of it's not seen. Uh, Jeremy, two questions. Uh, I'm just picking questions, mm -hmm. but... Uh, one person asked if it's essential to have talent to be an artist, you know, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. one of the I put in the chat is, you know, this is obviously something that you can build skills at and work on, but if you speak to that. And then the other thing was someone said, um, uh, can you give any tips on, uh, I believe it was uh, coming up with clothing ideas and clothing designs, I guess that they were kind of struggling with how to design that when they're coming up with character development mm -hmm. maybe just is there a method that you kind of look at or, or that you follow to, to come up with those designs mm -hmm. uh no you don't have to be talented uh drawing is a skill like plumbing or uh, uh being an electrician we, I, we joke that we're essentially a trade school in a lot of ways because and, and some of the best most talented students i ever knew were the worst when they got to school and I think that's because they had the least bad habits in place already. They were the most open to doing whatever their teacher said. Whereas the students who are really good when they come to school tend to have, you know, a little bit of an ego. I know I did. I was the best kid in my high school when I went to art school. And then I got to art school and realized, oh, I'm at a school full of the best kids. 
in high school. <laughs> um, but that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be with the best ones. And sometimes it's a big advantage not having a, a, a super developed skill set yet especially if you stay nimble and realize you might change majors. You can do that. Again, the foundation classes are pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, clothing design is awesome and amazing and difficult um, to come up with. That's why there's an Oscar category for it, you know, best costume design. And sometimes concept artists win that category these days. Concept art is changing. I remember the first, when I saw the first Guardians of the Galaxy and uh, the credits rolled and they listed the visual development team before they listed the actors in the credits. I was like, whoa. Uh, obviously with Marvel visual development's a big deal, but I was like, oh, that's a shift. You know, rarely do artists get top billing over the actors. And I don't know how often that happens, but uh, I think the winds are changing. Anyways, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a major part of, of what's going on. And the key is to have a target. So, you know, I, again, for me, um, I, if I'm developing a character, I not, not necessarily know, you know, where I'm going to go with. So I have to sit down and think about it. Where do I want this character to be from? Where do I want this? What, when do I want this character to be from? The future is the hardest. There's no reference from the future. You can't look it up and see what things are going to look like. So you have to use your imagination a lot. Um, but uh, uh, any other culture, obviously, you can look up and get interesting with. Now, if you're doing something more fantastical or, or fa you know, fantasies, uh, fairy tales, sci-fi, um, the, the trick then is to borrow from a culture. So, for example, Lord of the Rings. Um, all the different races are all based on human cultures. Uh, the dwarves were German, the elves were French, the humans were English from the English culture, and they were they would add, they would take reference of like what our costumes look like in those areas and add their own artistic twists because it was fantasy. It wasn't accurate historical stuff, so they could add cool straps or you know a different kind of thing on the on the weapon. You know something a little bit, a little with a little modern touch, a little bit more of a modern edge to the design, but using the traditional stuff as a basis. So I just recently saw my wife and kids wanted to watch uh, Rhea in The Last Dragon. And I was, uh, one of the things I enjoyed most about the movie was how that was finally a fantasy movie where they didn't use Europe, Middle Eastern Europe as a template for their, for their uh, cultural input on how to design clothing, weapons, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and he's, he's using kind of Southeast Asian uh, 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 cultures to kind of fuel the look for that. So that's a big part of like being cool is using unusual reference thinking around it. And again, when we start off, we always want to emulate the stuff that we love. So if you love Star Wars, if you love Lord of the Rings, your designs end up echoing those ideas. But if you really want to echo their, their uh, format, their process, then you find a culture to kind of base, to twist and turn. Again, if you're a fantasy, sci-fi kind of thing. Uh, Star Wars, you have samurai stuff in there with the Jedi. You have the Nazi stuff in there with the Empire and the First Order. They're borrowing from everything, which is what we all do. And we do that because humans have an association with it. We want to psychologically manipulate our audience into knowing how to feel about this character when they see them. That's the whole point. If it, are they a good guy? Are they a bad guy? Uh, can you trust them? Are they dangerous? We can, we can imply all those things with their design. And if you're borrowing from the, 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 the Third Reich, you know, uniforms, uh, that's your audience is going to know, oh, this is a bad guy uh, right away. Um, uh, whereas, you know, if you're, you know, it, if you're doing something from like a, a village and finding some sort of village, you know, uh, outfit from anywhere, there's villages all over the world, obviously. Um, then, you know, that character might be, you know, you know, a little less, you know, technologically, you know, adapt or, uh, you know, tends to be a little bit less of a, um, you know, warlord, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, you know, that can be usually a more heroic kind of a vibe like Luke and his robes, for example, in Star Wars. Um, so yeah, finding, you know, what you want, researching, looking up some ideas of, of where to get ideas from and where, what you might want to pull from. Otherwise you can set it in a specific era and have fun. Westerns, cowboys, pirates, mm, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there for those that are fun costumes to get into. So yeah, making your choice, uh, is a big first step. So here I'm using kind of a soft brush for the kit because it's got a lot of big soft kind of movements on it, which is which is kind of fun. And airbrushes, it, every program has them, including real life. And they're <laughs> the real life program, the simulation that we're all in currently. <laughs> and um, you can, uh, uh, you know, what I like about them is they, 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 they're they great at describing a large amount of area. Um, they can feel a little digitally um, and they can feel a little mushy if you don't balance them. So here, this part of the kit is kind of sitting forward on a shoulder. So um, that would cast a shadow, the lights above. And so I can cut across 
that part there, like, cause it's kind of coming from behind him. Um, and so I know through practice and through doing this kind of stuff a lot that light would, you know, eventually come through and, and cut across an area like that. Um, so I can kind of do the same thing down here now. Um, I ended up getting more into digital art than I did traditional. I feel like I got, I, I did better at, at digital art, partly because I just had a hard time with traditional in terms of like painting. I would spill paint, I would run out. Um, uh, I just was always kind of battling the medium more than most of my friends were who were training. And I was really good with computers. I was the, you know, the guy who built his own computer. Someone said they bought a computer. Oh, you should build your own computer. I would never offer to build a computer for them. I would just tell them they should build their own computer and then bounce. Um, but I used to build that stuff. And, and so I really liked, I was really at home with computers a lot. So um, it kind of ended up being a fun blend for me. Um, but I, again, all the traditional techniques are what saved me for how to keep growing and learning. All right. I'm, uh, I'm actually gonna just uh, throw a couple questions at you. Great. So I'm going to ask for the group. I uh, know there's some students that are actually on here that are uh, that are current students with our university, and they've been mm. they've been helping me out in the chat with good advice as well. Nice. Um, so here's some one of the questions I, I try to ask people, uh, and I try to speak on behalf of those students that are on the workshop tonight mm -hmm. that are just trying to figure out what should I do. Like I guarantee you, there's a bunch of you out there right now that are just having a panic attack. Like, should I pursue this career? Is this viable? Is this just a dream? Or is it something that I could turn into a reality? Uh, so the thing I wanted to ask you is, what made you kind of follow your passion here? What, what made you take that leap of faith to say, okay, this is viable. This is something I can make into a career. This is me making that choice to say, I want to do this for a living versus just kind of falling into whatever comes at you and just you know, ending up where you ending up. So I guess what gave you that confidence or what gave you that, that push to say, I'm going to go in this direction and actually stick with it. The initial push came from hubris. I, again, I am very old and I was going to, I went uh, to the movies to see a movie I was very excited for and I'm a nerd. So it was, uh, I went to go see the movie Spawn in the movie theater and uh, which was based on a comic book by Todd McFarlane and uh, a beloved comic book. And uh, the effects in it were really bad. I really hated them. And I thought, you know, I could see what was wrong with those. I, I could go do that. I think I could, if that's what they're putting out. <laughs> so I was being, I mean, it wasn't, it's not, it's not a, it's not a complimentary story because uh, basically that means I didn't know how hard those people were working, how hard it was to do like capes and CGI back then. And, but I knew that my taste level was high enough that I could tell that something was wrong with what was in that movie. Um, and then what ended up making me stick with it, um, I mean, ultimately, like I said, I was kind of discouraged from pursuing art school and uh, took that advice for a, a time at least. But um, I don't know what it, I mean, ultimately, it's the only thing that was making me happy, especially when I started doing it. it, it it's, the, it's the only thing I cared about. I studied, I did really well in math and I really like science and, you know, I could do those things, but the, 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 the fire wasn't there. And it was so exciting just to talk about art, let alone do it. And then, you know, seeing real progress. I didn't see progress myself, but other people would see my progress because I'm dying. I'm in it every day and I'm struggling and trying to get better. And um, then seeing my progress over time, but having people say, wow, you've gotten really good. <laughs> there was times I, you know, like I said, I went to school with a lot of really prominent, uh, very talented people. One of the guys I went to school with, his name's Josh Cooley. Um, we graduated together. Um, he uh, uh, went to go work at Pixar um, and uh, he directed Toy Story 4 won an Oscar for it. So he's the successful one. Um, but <laughs> he's a really, really awesome guy. He's uh, 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 still, you know, talks to his buddies and all that cool stuff. He's a really nice guy. I remember I started going to workshops. Then when I, when I leveled up as the Academy offers workshops, an extra session of drawing with the model, extra time with the teacher to talk about perspective or character design or whatever. We have workshops for all that kind of stuff. And um, I started going to the figure drawing workshops to get more practice drawing the figure because I was told by everybody, it's, that's how you get good is drawing more. So I listened and uh, I started challenging myself. I started saying, okay, I'm only going to draw an ink today. And these timed, you know, figure drawings with the figure models posing and changing every minute, every 30 seconds. And so, okay, I'm going to try and do it only ink. And it was hard and it was really frustrating for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then I started getting like, where I didn't hate it. 
And I remember Josh saw one of my drawings one time and went, you did that? Which is one of those awful backhanded insult slash compliments. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I can draw, Josh. I did that. <laughs> um, but that was also like, I remember that because that was like, oh man, I guess it's pretty impressive. Ultimately, it was a huge compliment. He wasn't trying to be a jerk. He just was naturally being a jerk. Just kidding. He's, he's not watching, of course, but uh, here I am, you know, talking smack about uh, an Oscar winning director. Maybe I should pivot. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, you know, another advantage to going to the school and working with us is that, you know, we all work. We all work in the industry. We all know people who work in the industry. We're all, <laughs> one of the things I'll say to my students, because sometimes students don't realize like, you know, it's, it's real when you're, when you're going to school here, it's the real deal. And, uh, um, you know, you, we talk about, you know, earning a reputation when you're in the industry and how the industry is kind of small and you want to be known as a good hard worker and someone they can count on. And some students don't seem to take that seriously sometimes. And they'll kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they go to class. Sometimes they don't, you know, sometimes they do the homework, sometimes they don't. And, um, I tell them, you know, really though, it's already too late. You're already meeting the industry. I mean, we all work, we all work at the studios, we all work for these places. And um, we know people at these places and, you know, uh, you're, you're part of it now. You're earning reputation even while you're in school, but that's also a great thing because, you know, if you earn that reputation and we know you're good, uh, then, you know, you, got, you, got, you get good recommendations out there from people who are actually in places that hopefully you're interested in being at as well. I don't know if there's a follow-up to that one, I forget. Uh, a student out there, uh, Sam, asked for any tips on how you draw folds. How do you paint them properly? Every time I do it, it turns out as a big mess. Yeah, um, uh, organization is a big one. Um, I took a lot. I took th three semesters of clothes figure drawing. Um, and um, the one of them was with, and I tell my students this story, it was the toughest critique I ever got. And there was a teacher, uh, her name was Barbara Bradley. And Barbara Bradley is, was like a matriarch of the academy. She was a, a big part of what she created, the illustration department uh, many decades ago uh, that, you know, before there was concept art and visual development stuff. And uh, the, um, the uh, illustration was the one to go for learning how to draw, you know, for entertainment. And um, she was semi-retired when I was going to school and I got her classes portfolio review only. So by some mistake I got in. That was like, it was like a super advanced kind of like clothes figure class. She got to teach kind of what she wanted because she was amazing and um, was semi-retired. And um, I remember we all had to draw the seven kinds of folds for our homework that week on people. Spiral folds, zigzag folds. So we, you, t you spend semesters learning all the different kinds of folds, you know, drop folds, uh, uh, diaper folds, um, you know, uh, I forget how many is that, four? I forget. <laughs> I'm not saying them all right now. Um, uh, I usually can't. Um, but uh, we were all drawing them and she was very upset with us. None of us had done a good job that week. And um, she was, you know, so good. She was the kind of artist, no joke, that Disney would call when they needed help drawing. They called her because none of them were cracking uh, baby Tarzan. They were for Tarzan when he's a baby, then none of them could draw it right. So they called her up to go whip their artist into shape. And she did. She went out there and told them what was up. Anyways, um, so I was taking a class with her and she said, you know what, well, I want you guys to draw a contour line down all your, your figures so I could see at least see what you're trying to draw. It's not working. And so a contour line would be like, if I'm drawing a line down his face, for example, like here's his forehead and it goes in here and then back out on his, on his eye and then back out here and then over his cheek and then underneath over here and then down on his neck and back out over his collar, or contour line, showing you what the peaks and valleys are. And um, so we all did that. And mine was the third one in it. She went and looked at the first assignment and said, oh, okay, I see what you're doing wrong. You should be using tone when you're using line. You should be using line when you're using tone. Switch that up, you'll be great. She was really good at assessing problems. And um, then she went to um, the second student, something similar. Oh, this is what you should do. Change this, change that. And then she went to mine. It was a longer pause on my homework. Um, it felt like it was 20 minutes. It was probably a minute or two. And she uh, looked at it and she went, Puh! And then she kept walking. That was my critique that day was a big bark of a laugh and moving on everyone. Oh, and like they patted me in the back, shake it off, Salib, you'll be all right. I, I still don't know exactly what it was that day that I did that was so funny, uh, but I definitely worked harder <laughs> at getting better full times. I ended up getting, uh, uh, at the end of the semester, we all had a contest to see what the best character design. We did the character design for a final and uh, I got in the top three. So 
uh, I did okay. I, I improved. I was able to use her knowledge and talent to help myself get better. It worked. Um, there's a lot of practice. Um, so I, I, you know, knowing those different types of folds is really helpful. And I'm kind of a sculptural painter. Um, I like painting form more than I like painting anything else. And so here, these are kind of like almost like a flattened, like spiral fold. I mean, they're quite, they're not quite zigzag folds. And so, you know, I, I know the structure in my mind, this is the foremost one. So it's going to get the most light. It's going to cast shadows in the one behind it and on down the line. And so basically it's just an offset. I'll come in and I'll erase, you know, some, uh, a, a cast shadow from that top pleat onto the bottom one and, you know, leave it there. So again, I'm kind of painting dark to light. So I have the light paint on top. So I can just erase away, erase away where the shadows need to come into play. And then for areas like this, these are basically tubes. Um, these are all just a series of tubes, these folds, you know, that pop up as they run and there's creases in between. And it's a class analysis of form that everyone takes when they first start. And basically you learn how to draw the basic geometric shapes, spheres, cubes, cylinders. So these are cylinders and the cylinder is, you know, this and like, where's your light? So, you know, like this, right. And there's, it's like a capsule, right. It feels like three dimensional because of the way the light's moving around it. Spheres, same way. And so, you know, you learn how to do this the right way first with like charcoal on paper. And that's how you learn about the anatomy of a shadow. Um, and you, you learn to deal with it. And then you learn some digital tools that can speed it up. But if you don't know the foundation elements for these digital tools, you'll use them wrong. Um, and so, and again, here, I'm not using necessarily soft tools here. I made the brush so small, it becomes kind of hard to reg, but I know this is just a series of tubes. Um, so kind of organizing that idea. Um, so in the drawing, I, I kind of plan for that. And, you know, it's a lot about like, one of the things they tell you about in cliff figure classes, uh, stretch folds versus compression folds. There's two main areas that are going to happen in one place where you're pulling up and you get stretches happening and then another, well, a compression happening. And then that's going to cause stretches to happen. They're always related. So even those seven different types of folds, the two big categories are stretch and compression. Right? They all fit into that category somewhere. And so I know if it's tight, you're going to get some creases pulled in it, you know, so on and so forth. Um, that's generally how I'll kind of organize that stuff. Um, and that's usually what gives me an advantage to be able to uh, navigate through it, not look like I completely out of my element. Do a little bit of this color variation now. I didn't block in everything. These belts are kind of a brown color. Now, if I want to go more graphic, this is kind of a comic booky kind of style of drawing. Um, it's not super realistic. Um, it's not it's not cartoony either. So if I as I paint it, I can push it more realistic. Um, but uh, I do like the line. Uh, I think it's kind of fun to keep line in. So I kind of wait sometimes and see again how much time I have, or because it's just time. Uh, you can paint something quicker if it's more stylized, like more like animation, cell shaded, comic booky. Um, and if you want something more realistic, it just takes a longer investment. Um, and so color variation can really add a lot, though, even at the flat stage. So, for example, these belts are brown, but maybe one belt is a darker brown and a little less saturated, a little more gray. I'll make it darker than this so it's really clear. And maybe another belt is a little bit lighter, and another belt's a little bit more red. And I mean, that's pretty dramatic, actually. I'm gonna undo that. Oh, undo. Oh, that's one thing that, that computers have that sketchbooks don't is the undo, but which some people think ruin, is ruining art. Because spontaneity, the ability to find happy accidents, the ability to roll with punches uh, is a big part of what makes us cool, what makes people like artwork. And when you get a deadline, that undo button sure does. Uh, no one's complaining about it then. <laughs> so, kind of depends. Um, so I'm going to do some color variation here. I'm going to add some variety to the types of belts and make it unique. And even like human skin, it's not the same color all across it. And again, that's a big divide. Like in a cartoon, it'll be primarily the same color. But even if you look at like animation, like if you look at like, like Wreck-It Wreck Ralph, for example, they knew skin wasn't all one color. If you look at his design, um, you know, uh, look at his face, the red on his cheeks, the cool, it gets a lot cooler here, almost implying like a five o'clock shadow kind of vibe on his face. Penelope Von Schweet, she's got color mm -hmm. all over her color changes and value changes. Her nose is actually quite dark to get that kind of red in it. Um, so the more kind of color variation, that's a more advanced thing, but the more color variation you can kind of include in your work, it'll make it feel kind of more realistic. So 
that's kind of a bright red. But now, now that I've kind of, it's already, I kind of like it a little bit more that I've added some different colors in there. It just feels a little bit more. I mean, it was all one color in blue before. This is a design that created by Carla Ortiz. She's, um, I just, I looked at her costume design. She created the Doctor Strange character design for Marvel. So that's another big one. Um, my, one of the million dollar questions that I hear all the time, Hector, not to step on your toes, um, is uh, the, um, you know, how do you, what's a good resource? How do you get better? What do you, what do you search out? Which is a good question. Because art school, obviously we're providing you a lot of resources and a lot of guidance, but you're gonna have your own journey and your own kind of, you wanna be able to have your own journey and go above and beyond what's happening with everybody else in class so you can get better. Um, and uh, what movies do you like? What games do you like? Do a little research. You kids in your interwebs, <laughs> you know how to use them. So Google, who's, you know, what artists were in those movies, what artists worked on those games, and then you go find them online. They're going to have a social media account. And then on that social media account, they're probably going to have like links to like their demos and their tutorials of how they do painting. And then you can study from the exact like people, you know, like get little extra lessons to complement what you're learning. They rarely have anything comprehensive. It's usually like, oh, here's my tip for drawing a face. Here's this, here's that. But then they also will post things like, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to be at this place especially when we're not in a pandemic, I'm going to be at a convention. I'm going to be at a bookstore doing a signing um, and you can go by and meet them. And who knows, maybe you say hi to them, like a few other things online and see them at the thing. And, you know, Oh, you know, sometime I'd like to be able to send you some artwork. If you could take a look at it, and, you know, the next thing you know, you're making a relationship, but you can kind of look at not only, you know, how they do their work, but then, you know, look up the art of oftentimes games and movies sell like art of books and they show the process of what they do. And those are the blueprints to um, how to do it. If you want to get in at a studio, whether it's Blizzard or Pixar or, you know, uh, the Ubisoft or whatever, um, uh, you can, they have, you know, art of stuff and artists that'll post like what they do and how they do it. Sometimes you can even Google the art directors that work at these places and uh, they'll have YouTube videos of answering questions like, what is it that you want to see in someone you, when you interview them for a job as a concept artist? <laughs> I've done that. Um, it's very, very useful and very helpful. Um, so here, I'll do a little color variation on Dr. Stephen Strange. So it's a great way to kind of like not only boost what it is that you're already, you know, doing in school, but then to kind of like really kind of take control over like you know, like stylistically, a lot of students worry about style too. And, you know, uh, the thing about style is it just happens. There's no, you, it's hard to control. You already have one. There's nothing anyone can do about it. Um, uh, you'll be asked to work in different styles on projects in our major, but that makes you a guided missile. If you can adapt to different styles, then you can work. Um, it's rare that a studio hires you on the first day of the job to sit you down and go, what do you want to draw today? Um, they'll tell you, okay, so your head concept artist is this person. This is their style. We want you to do some extra artwork and support them. So do it in there. This is their method. Use that, yada, yada, yada. So when we tell you guys to switch things up, it's part of your training. We're getting you ready. Um, but you'll have it a style. And usually style comes about by us copying the people that we like. And then eventually it morphs into something else. That's 99% of all the artists journey out there. Put some kind of darker red spots on his cheeks to give him a little color variation. So as I zoom out, you know, this stuff feels a little less wonky, I think. Let's see, where is, it's all there. Did I zoom, I merged down? No, it's right here, okay. So now I can go through and I'm gonna, let's see. Well, this is, so Carla Ortiz was the, she's the artist who works at, uh, she works, she's a Bay Area. She's a traditional artist. She she has gallery shows of all of her traditional oil paintings and everything. And uh, she works for Marvel. The head of Marvel Visual Development is a guy named Ryan Minerding. We had him as a guest speaker a couple of years ago. Um, came to the school and showed his work and talked about working there. Um, he hired Carla to work on, I think Doctor Strange was her first movie. She'd worked on like Game of Thrones and stuff before that. So she was already kind of awesome. Um, and she did the designs for him and his character in this movie. So I'm using her stuff as I paint. Uh, her designs. She's cool. She's very active online. She has a, a, a Twitter account that she uses a lot, Instagram, all that stuff. And uh, she posts some cool paintings that she does. She'll post time lapses and stuff too, which is neat. And watching her paint, it's, it's difficult because she's so good. She's saying she's so disciplined at working traditionally. She never zooms in once. She'll do this whole thing like this the whole time and make it like perfect. That's why she's probably one of the best on the planet. <laughs> what are you going to do? 
Uh, so I, I'm working on that. I would like to not zoom in. I just got some new glasses. So um, I know I'm zooming a lot less, which is nice. I knew I needed them. My wife is about fed up with me squinting around at everything. So this is, no, so obviously this painting, I'm, you know, again, just kind of coloring by numbers here, so to speak, and blocking stuff in. So this ends up being kind of an easier process when you've done your drawing first. So going back to that question that I got raised uh, an hour ago, um, uh, you know, about what's, you know, how do you transition? <laughs> uh, short answer, this is how I do it. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, you know, find a way to um, bridge that gap and, and use whatever method I'm most comfortable in and then bring in the computer. And then, because again, painting, you can kind of develop this, you know, hand-eye business by blocking in light and shadow, as opposed to trying to get all the details down and following details you've already established. Do that enough times, and uh, pretty soon you'll be like, you know, why am I drawing on paper? Let me try it in digital. And that starts your journey. So here I'm just kind of dotting in. I'm not even being accurate. I'm just going fast and kind of sloppy right now. Um, I'm not even being accurate, but this is like a folded, like braided kind of leather cord that's hanging off of his, it might even be cloth in the original design. And I'm deciding it's leather. So I might be ruining Carla's amazing work here. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm just kind of blocking it in. And as I zoom out, it, eh, it's readable enough. <laughs> Paintings can be a little loose, again, depending on who's, who's in charge of all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, the, here we're to a certain level, and I could probably go in and block in some brown now for the boots. Um, and, uh, you know, some highlights again on some of these belts in these areas up here. Grab this color and go a little bit brighter on it. And how, the, how does shadow and light hit this stuff here and here and so on and so forth. And it's kind of do that all the way down. I try to block in the biggest shapes first and then move into the smaller shapes. Um, it's always a good method. Um, again, especially for time management. If you find yourself painting one of those eyes for an hour when you're zoomed in, you know, at this level, uh, you know, and you zoom out and no one sees it. I mean, honestly, no one's zooming in this close on your work that you post online. As much as we like to think people care that much. They, I mean, we're all on our phone. Everyone's on their phone, right? Just bleep, bleep, bleep. Um, so, uh, you know, the level of detail is, is negotiable, I think, especially if it's for fun. Uh, Hector, uh, what, what, what kind of time are we looking at? We got a little more time to kill. Should I, can I go back over to Darth Vader for a little bit and try some crazy stuff or? Yeah, uh, I'd say we got about 20 minutes. If you want to switch over to okay. the Vader here. Sure. Um, and I'm a little bit more warmed up now. So, the other thing that I was doing when I was sketching this out and thumbnailing it was thinking about like the mood of the atmosphere. So, you know, uh, a dark Vadery, dark Vadery night um, and just kind of blocking in some ideas and some stuff. And I, you know, if it's the carbon freeze chamber, there's gonna be steam and smoke everywhere. And I like painting that stuff. I like painting atmospherics because um, I learned um, at a certain point that atmospherics are kind of abstract. Smoke, clouds, all that kind of stuff, it can go anywhere. So if you have an area of your painting you want to darken or brighten, you can just use these things to do it. And for us, it's even easier than it is for on a movie set. They have to actually get a smoke machine and lights. We can just go and kind of paint it in. So I did some kind of rough ideas of what I might do with this piece. So I'm going to kind of turn that back off again now and think of that as a guide and maybe come back to it here and there. But I think initially, yeah, let's get a lot darker here. So what I'm also going to do is start I mean, his silhouette's okay. Um, the proportions need a little bit of nudging. So, and that's the other thing too, is I, you know, I was going back and forth. Do I do a prepared drawing? Do I do kind of something from scratch? And um, both can be valuable to watch. The stuff from scratch, you don't see as often. Even if they say they're doing it from scratch, uh, they're probably have practiced it beforehand. Uh, I have a lot of people online who do that stuff, but they don't tell you is that they're hustling. Uh, you know, they're trying to get those likes. They're trying to get a good work and good for them. They should be. And so a lot of times when you see speed paints. Um, I mean, usually those are environments and environments have a lot of wiggle room. How big are buildings? What shape are mountains? How big are mountains? Any, any size, any shape uh, for in a lot of these ways. So um, character stuff, you don't see speed paints of character as much unless they did like a drawing beforehand or it's like a, just a face or something like that. So I knew I was kind of like, asking for trouble to a certain degree, but um, uh, uh, I knew I was going to block in some stuff and have some fun with big atmospherics too, which is something that I've always enjoyed. So I'm going to block in some big basic shapes here. 
Um, I changed the size of my brush to get it to answer like a technical question. I mean, it's, it's kind of again the same for most pieces of software, but um, uh, there, are, there are some fun options for working digitally. Like at Wacom, they have these, what, these it's like a remote. Um, and uh, I use this one from time to time. What I ended up doing again ergonomically is I, I learned, I was trained to use the keyboard to go between, you know, the hotkeys, B for brush, E for eraser. It's not really that crazy. Um, but for other things, I pre-programmed these buttons on this remote. Um, and it's magnetic, so you just whoop, slap it against the side of your monitor and it's there. Um, and I move between my keyboard and this to keep my wrist uh, from having any developing carpal tunnel. Um, I don't get it as much from my drawing hand, but I get it from the keyboard hand a lot. It depends, I think, on your angle and what you're doing. I learned that from an animator friend of mine who when he was a computer animator and using a mouse all day, he would rotate between a mouse, a joystick cursor, and uh, a, a stylus so he could keep healthy. You guys are young, so you know, ah, we're fine, ah, we don't need to do that. But um, next thing you know, you're not young and you've been doing it the wrong way for a long time and uh, things hurt. So, you know, good good practices right on, right, right, right away are good. So again, I'm gonna block in this silhouette base here. I, I just wanna spend the whole time just drawing Darth, but there's a little bit more going on here than just Darth. So I call him Darth because we're such good friends, he and I. Not Anakin, never Anakin, just Darth. So this is gonna be a little bit, again, more atmospheric and I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead of actually recreating the carbon freeze chamber, I'm gonna kind of mimic it a little bit to have fun. Now I'm gonna do a fun trick here. Um, it's a digital trick for, any, for those of you who like digital trickery. Um, let's see, okay, cool. Let me just clean this up a little bit here. Hmm. Um, so I, uh, in, the, in the carbon freeze chamber, there's all these lights on the floor. And it's a cool geometric pattern. So another way you can speed things up. And again, this is a trick. This is a shortcut. Um, but uh, I had to learn how to do this traditionally first uh, for this to make any sense, to be honest with you, and use it effectively. Um, the, the, I have my reference up over here. And the uh, lighting pattern in the floor um, of this room is like this and like this. And then there's a line that goes like this. Let me just, let me use a brush that doesn't have any pressure change on it. Just block this in. So I'm gonna hit tap and then hold shift and hit tap to kind of uh, make a straight line in between these two. That's how this program can make straight lines, Photoshop. So it's one strong long one and one, uh, one that's broken with a dot at the end like this. So now what I can do is start to cheat. I, do, I can duplicate that layer. I made it on its own layer and then rotate. So I'm building an asset. Uh, and then I can do that again. I can merge that down into the layer of the original one. So now that they're both together, and then I duplicate that. I bet you, some of you are able to see where this is going. I'm gonna merge this one down again. Duplicate that. Now I'm not rotating them quite enough. I think there's a scale issue that's going on here. Um, it's not gonna make a circle when I need it to. So I might have to modify this when I'm done. Uh, and I'll just go quick, you know, duplicate that. But this is the fun trick. So again, there are some, there's some ways that digital honestly can be faster. Um, and there's some ways that, uh, I say digital can be faster, of course there is. And some ways that traditional can be faster. especially if it's, you know, a power outage <laughs> or, you know, uh, your Adobe account isn't, you know, letting you log in. Those are the days you're like, you know what? Traditional, traditional. Anyways, so I'm doing what's called a free transform. It's uh, the quickies control T. You, every program has it. You can transform an asset. I'm going to move these over a little bit so I can see. Get this down in here. And what I'm gonna do is, so hey, enter to complete that transform. Do I even merge down at this point? I'm gonna make these a little bit smaller. There's no reason for this to be this big. Let's do this. There we go, now I can see it. There we go. Yeah, you know what, I'll merge down and then duplicate the whole thing. And well, actually, if I was being smart. So this is where like some knowledge of these programs can come in handy. Like if I do it like this and then hit, and then duplicate it, hit Control T, I can right click and say flip horizontal. 
do any rotating, I can just kind of like line it up. And if I did a good job, it'll be perfect. I didn't and it's not, but that's okay. I don't mind, I'll just go fix it. I'll erase away like this part here. Where does that end? There, like that. And on this one, I'll erase, erase away this part right here. Too far. And you know, that's eh, close enough. Oops. So now I got this. There's nothing up my sleeve, nothing here, nothing there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a free transform again. Command T or Control T. And now I'm gonna hold the Control button on a Mac, it's Command. Because normally like I can, I can make this shrink. If I hold Shift, I can squish it, which is not bad. But if I'm even cooler, I will hold Control and I'll put this like in perspective. So now if I was working traditionally, I would use like stencils. I would use other drawing guides. I use rulers, I use stencils, I use those kinds of things. And because I learned how to use those kinds of things, I come up with this stuff on my own. Like this is something I developed. I mean, other people have developed this. I didn't invent this, but I never saw anyone else do it before I started doing it and then realized it was a thing. And it was because I used like S curves and like protractors and, and compasses and things like that to draw in perspective and knew I needed drawing aids going digital. And I wasn't about to put a compass on my Cintiq screen <laughs> with that needle, eh, you know, so um, and ellipse guides and things like that. So um, I knew I needed a way to kind of develop this stuff and started doing it. And it was, it was also because I had a really strong education in uh, uh, Photoshop, just general Photoshop. I knew how to navigate through the program through my classes. So I was able to kind of find my way forward to being more of a digital artist at a certain point. So there's that. And then there's so sort of the platform that he's on. I'll do something similar. I have reference over here and there's one circular platform and it kind of looks like this. I'll make it this really easy to go fast. So I drew one. Am I gonna keep trying to draw more to make it perfect and go fast? Nah, if I'm going fast. I'll just do, do the same thing, duplicate this, bring this over. So I'm building the platform that he's actually standing on now, where his feet are against. Yeah. Let's do one more of these and that'll be good for this section. And then, okay, so I got that. And there's one that's above it. Actually, yeah. It's gonna be a little bit longer and this one, Actually, if it's a little bit longer, what I can do is I'm gonna. So I want to. I want it to be this one to be a little bit longer, but this one has some of those uh, lights where there's only one dot at the end. So I'm gonna use another digital trick. I'm gonna use a selection. I'm gonna select part of this layer, only the only part that I want to use. I'm gonna select part of it. I don't. I want to extend some of these, but not all. Some of them I want to put a dot on the end. So I'm gonna select this one. This is a marquee selection tool. I just click and drag to make a square around. Oops. I'll click and drag a square around something to make it. Now, if I hold shift, I can do that again over here and on and on and on. In fact, what I may end up doing instead of stretching them, is just, I mean, I'm gonna hit copy like you would on your phone and in any program, command C, control C, control C, and then control V to paste. And I just bring these down. So I have, you know, a second copy of it, but I'm just gonna lower that down and that can merge it down. Then a new layer, make my little dot, Boop. and then copy that and bring it over. Normally, I would draw this stuff out, but this is like precise machined metal that, like, I'm drawing that you know someone did measure out perfectly, and um, you know it was probably on some sort of assembly line, even when they made it for the movie, um, to look machined and perfect, and you know, imperial. Even though it's not an imperial place, Bespin, it was Lando's place, but you know, nerd alert. Um, so. Um, I'm using machine like methods to kind of go with the flow and make it look the way it's supposed to look. So the thing I had to learn the hard way was, you know, how do you, you know, mimic perfection and use methods that involve, you know, per perfection where I take my hand out of it a little bit. And you'll see this too, like there's obviously a lot of use of 3D in our industry as well. And that's why we're offering 3D classes as part of our concept art training as well. 
Okay, so this next one, let's see where we got it. I don't know. Anything on that layer? No, we're getting rid of, oh yeah, there it is. See, then you have too many layers and you start losing track. <laughs> what layer, huh? You can name them. It's a technique I, I uh, suggest. Cool, this one's supposed to be a little bit longer. I'll merge down again, duplicate it again, and pop it out. It's supposed to be a little bit wider too. Do that again, bring it back to here. Now it's getting a little bit shorter. Kind of match the other side. I'm gonna put this in a circle so it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm gonna cut off parts when I'm done. That's not so violent. Okay, I'm gonna merge all this together. Oops, not all of it. Yeah, too much. I wanna keep that separate. Cool. Okay, then I can merge these layers together. So now they're together. And I can get rid of this right here and this right here so that it's more symmetrical. And then I can take this whole thing again and flip it the other way. So I'm going to right click and flip vertical. Bring this up like this. And I ended up getting a little, I need to put, I know this is longer than a circle will be. So I am going to squish it. That's good. Now, I am going to, again, either I would use a compass or some sort of guide if I was drawing traditionally because I can't draw perfect circles. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to use a selection and hold shift so it makes a perfect circle. Kind of do this. And um, I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to invert my selection. Right now it's selecting what's inside those, those, those marching ant lines. I am going to uh, invert my selection select inverse so now it's selecting what's outside that circle and then delete oh wrong layer here we go delete so that's the platform it's going to stand on so now i can do the same thing i did before Control t hold the control button Beep. got a little checker boardy that's what I get for not sketching it in first. It's a little bit too much. That's all right. I'll leave it the way it is for now. Not quite what I was hoping for, but he's playing checkers or chess. I'm going to end up kind of blocking some of that anyway. So now the cool part about this is the atmospherics. So again, he's dark and he gets a dark background. That's bad design. <laughs> you can't see anything that's dark if it gets a dark background. So I gotta lighten things up behind them. Luckily, I know how to do that. Um, I'm gonna stay in black and white and just kind of have fun real quick because we're getting near the end of stuff. And so I can use like a big soft brush that goes using on Doctor Strange before to fill in areas and kind of just, again, it's, it's pressure sensitive. So I'm kind of going light with, with my white, uh, uh, you know, color loaded into my brush and make smoke. But you can use, this is where I'm gonna use some custom brushes. Yeah, that's what we're here for, right? Some custom brushes um there's all sorts of like you know, i divide things up and i have brushes i developed over decades um some are great some are too stupid um cloud brushes it's similar i can develop um clouds with a big giant airbrush and a lot of it's basically about not using the color white using something that's a little bit darker than white and creating some cool like i, I paint clouds and smoke a lot um it's something that it, i'm apparently getting known for and i try to do more graphic work because i think that's fun people my clients go where's all the smoke your guy does all the smoke and stuff. Yeah. So if you get known for something, get used to it. Um, and then the bottom side, if the light's coming from below, which it is, I can kind of come in here and kind of like hit the bottom side of things. Because again, these are all a bunch of spheres. Good old analysis of form, almost like the cylinders on Dr. Strange's folds. I can just come in here and hit up brighter colors where the light's coming from below. And it's kind of starting to really simply create form. And I can go there and model it and take my time. But instead of doing that, I'm going to cheat and go fast and use a um, cloud brush. This is one I kind of took out for another artist and then worked on and made myself. And it, it basically, it, it like automatically like rotates and like generates kind of randomness to it. So um, you can, if I, you know, if you push hard, it's, it's, it's certain, of, you know, results and whatever. And I've got a whole bunch. So I don't rely on one. Um, I'll use a few. And so now I can kind of like illuminate him. Now he's not dark against a dark background anymore. It's still a dark room, but I could turn on the smoke machine. 
And uh, so I have that. Now, how far do I want to go with this, right? Like, do I want to, you know, and out in front, uh, kind of go with this and uh, have smoke coming up from the platform a little bit. So now I'm kind of covering him up. Now, just doing smoke isn't that cool either. I want to design. Smoke can be any shape, right? If it can be any shape, now I got a, now I got a responsibility to make cool shapes. So again, I'm going to avoid white at first. It's a darker value at first. White's kind of, I mean, it's as high, it's as bright as you can get. So you got nowhere to go if you start off with white. You can't get any brighter. And I like to, you know, go dark to light and kind of build stuff. Now, these are kind of thicker columns of smoke and fog and whatever. So I'm going to thin them out a little bit. It's kind of hefty in front of him. I want to see some individual trails because that's what it looks like in the movie. And what I kind of like is, you know, atmosphere kind of blocking him off down there, not really seeing where his feet touch necessarily, kind of just a hint. So I didn't go into crazy detail down there because I knew my plan was to eventually kind of obscure it. And, you know, maybe I have, do I want a new layer for my extra smoky stuff down here? Eh, maybe, sure. The only drawback to the, how much layers you use is how strong is the memory on your computer. The more layers, the more dense your document is. Um, back here, I got a bunch of weirdness because I did a bunch of light up behind my platform. So I'm going to come in and get that away so it looks a little more like it's supposed to look. And, you know, now I can kind of, so I've got, I've turned on my fog machine and, you know, so here all these are different. I mean, I got them, they're, they're out there if you want to try brushes like these. I recommend learning to paint traditionally first um, because, uh, now I'm going to like turn on the lights. So now I'm going to go into the light. If I was going full color, I would I would slow down a little bit and uh, I would have to uh, go between different uh, temperatures as well as different values. The, the, the darker smoke would be more of a red. The brighter smoke would be more of a yellow. And this way I can just work fast and go with value and kind of plan out the shot. And so here I can hit the bottom part of the smoke in certain areas a little bit more to kind of begin apply this kind of lighting. And so when you have lots of smoke and lots of light like this, it becomes, you know, how much, how much is too much. Uh, according to me, uh, there is no such thing as too much, but that's of course incorrect. Um, you know, and so I'm, I'm kind of trying to design. So I'm, I'm having everything going in one direction as if there's some sort of breeze in the room or maybe an exhaust vent that's sucking this stuff out of the room, um, giving it movement. Is cool because it contrasts with Vader and him standing stoic and still. I obviously had his cape flow to give that a little bit of movement as well to make it feel a little bit more alive. The more static and stiff things are, eh, you know, the less cool it is. Um, and then now I can light him. So there's two light sources on him. It's one from below and one from above. So, you know, I'm going to kind of go quick here. Um, but, you know, I know he's got his mask and he's got his, his eye, eye little things will be catching light kind of from below. And he's got his grill. It's kind of skull face right here. Um, some of this stuff will catch light a little bit more than the rest. And I'm using white, which is a mistake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lighten this up a little bit and erase it. No, no, I think that looks better. So that's my hint that I got too excited and started using white, I'll use a gray instead. Got nowhere to go if I start off with white. I gotta build stuff up. I was trying to paint with an eraser. Uh, so no matter how advanced you think you are, you're still going to try and paint with an eraser in front of a bunch of people watching you uh, to remind you that you're not as cool as you might think you are. It will always happen. So he's got these kind of like, this kind of like drape, this kind of robe comes around here. So again, I'm going to try and use pressure sensitivity to work intuitively and quickly. Push harder at the bottom and let it off as I go up. So that way, and maybe come back down and do it again. And you know, you see there's a looseness there. I'm not perfectly matching that brush stroke. I'm good with that for now. That provides a painterly looseness. So I'm letting those mistakes kind of live in my work as I do this kind of stuff. Again, if I'm working at the right scale, you won't even notice it. I kind of like that darker value even better. His robe shouldn't be shining, that value's too bright. So I color picked. And that's a lot of what I do too. And I learned traditionally is that you, you, I blend my paint on the canvas. I'm not good at picking the right color and smacking it down. I have to, I pick a color that I think is close enough. I'm always wrong. 
And as I paint it, it's like, uh, you know, it's a little bit darker, a little bit lighter, and I fidget with it. But if I'm painting on a black background and grabbing a gray that's too light, as I paint lightly, I don't get the pure color. I mean, even with white, I paint light. It's that's kind of a gray. And I go, that's much better. I'll pick that color now instead and paint with that and hit undo. And I'll go in. And that's like oil painting. You blend. So thank goodness for that in those classes. Um, he's got his big belt. And so I'm kind of trying to see if I can, you know, again, can, you know, hit stuff up from below. He's got his robe kind of comes down here. So I'm painting underneath some of that smoke layers. It's the advantage to having multiple layers and not allowing you to work faster too. Maybe part of his, he's got this cool kind of like pattern on his arms. Let's kind of quickly go in there and kind of create it. And I'm going to nail the side of his face a little bit here. Now, as I was saying, he's got, I can do two light sources. There's one from above too, but there's also his lightsaber, which can be a light source, you know, if you're cool. And so the light source from above, I'm going to make it a little bit less intense, even, even though this is pretty dark. I'm going to go in here and just kind of like lightly. So again, I'm going to go big to dark. His helmet has that crease down the center of it. I'm going to paint the whole thing first. And then I'm going to come in because it's on its own layer and erase away that crease. So that way it looks like one continuous light that's hitting these surfaces. And I'll come back here. Again, now I've got ways to go. I, I, maybe I do go a little bit punchy with that. His helmet's so shiny, I can't resist. I'm going to come in there. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to use some white near the end of this little sketch. See if I can kind of like put some highlights. Now highlights, the trick to highlights, they're just a reflection of the light source, the reflection of the light bulb that are like, it's like stretched and moving across the material. So if you put some really specific shapes on there, it feels like it looks right. What do light bulbs look like? They're white bulbs. Kind of paint that you know, where you're going. And so now the lightsaber. Um, I am going to erase away this sketchy version of the lightsaber. And I'm going to use, there's a lot of straight line tools you can use in Photoshop. I try one like this. This is the polygonal selection tool. I use it all the time. Um, I use it to paint with. I block in my shapes with it. This makes clean, sharp shapes. So again, I'll hide my selection so you can see it's just, you know, I don't have to be accurate now. I blocked it in first. Now, even this, I can tell you Lucasfilm would say, mm, no, it's a little bit darker than that. And there's a white glow on the center. So I got too excited with the white. I can come here in the center and there's like a white kind of the core, which is good because again, it's a little bit more detailed now. It's not just a big white line, that's, that's, that's better. I got that through obviously observation and uh, practice and being told I was wrong a lot. Also being a nerd and loving Star Wars and really wanting to see, you know, study Darth Vader's lightsaber. Now I can do again, just whatever, soft round brush, that airbrush I was talking about. We're gonna make a new layer, go over this. Glows are the last thing, you know, something like that. And then maybe this has its own smoke coming off of it. Sure, why not? Let's make it really cool. Maybe I'll do the smoke layer, actually. I don't know how much I want to keep blocking off and adding. That's not bad. Maybe I'll do the smoke layer like behind him. So that white line doesn't get covered. It can stay intact. And I try to make it look like there's smoke actually coming up from the lightsaber, too. You know, I'm losing it a little bit here. So maybe I need to tone that down. Uh, that layer can lower the opacity and kind of do something like this. Maybe come back in a little bit more strong. The smoke is coming out the actual lightsaber itself here. Um, you know, do I want to go in now and kind of start adding some fun effects? Like, you know, do I want to add some glows? This is on the wrong layer. Let's go, I'll use this layer. So nice glows right here to really push this. You know, everything glows. Everything's glowing. Um, that's what's fun about the set is the lighting. It's a fun one to try and paint. Um, do I want to have any, you know, glow hitting this platform he's on, you know, whatever. And then, you know, obviously uh, as in the beginning sketches you saw, I was kind of messing around with some of the structures in the room um, and uh, applying some of that. I just used, you know, the polygonal lasso tool and did a fill, you know, with black on these kinds of things. Um, I can see myself now kind of moving these, moving the, some of the smoke effects I did in front of that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe even, <laughs> Maybe even um, going behind it, just again, a simple airbrush and kind of like, so I got, I'm losing it, right? So I can like brighten up areas behind it so I can see that shape. 
when I want to. It's abstract. Do I want to see it more? Do I want to see it less? It doesn't matter at this point what values I'm using, as long as I make a cool image, as long as it's readable and I can see it. So atmospherics can solve, you know, a lot of problems. It's be an abstract thing. That's why they use them in movies and things like that. Um, so I think I think that's a good spot. What do you think, Hector? It looks good. Uh, uh, I think we had a little bit of like, why isn't the saber red? I'm like, it's black and white. But let's do it. Let's do it. That's that. You know what? Let's change it. Let's do it. So one of the things that you can do when working digitally is you can add, you can change things to color fast. There's a lot of ways to do it. One of the quickest ways is to uh, use a color layer. So make a new layer, uh, put it uh, on top, and set it to color, and it'll leave the values below intact and uh, add the color only. What happens? I'm going to try an overlay. I got, I got kind of white, kind of bright. Color layers can be finicky. Maybe even add a little bit of that red. Maybe that's what's really hitting him. I try not to use the swatches directly. Um, using swatches directly, basically they're recognizable now. We can, we, so many people have used them so often. So I still try to make, so it's a, it's a cool light in the rest of the room. Sure, let's do this. Let's try a color layer here. A little intense, let's lower that down a little bit. There we go. And then yes, the topmost here, we can get into some yellows and some reds and some oranges. So yeah, I mean, oftentimes, you know, when you're training traditionally, you learn to work in value first and plan out your values because they're actually more important than color value. It's a higher level, you know, hierarchy in a painting. If the value's not working, it doesn't matter how good your colors are, you're gonna have trouble. So you want to get your values working first, and with digital, you don't have to start completely over. You can um, go into uh, go right into color. It is a lot more dramatic with these colors. I think you, uh, yeah, you got a lot of excitement when you <laughs> now. <laughs> it's a good suggestion. Whoever said, I mean, it was probably more than one person. Whoever said that, A plus, automatic A plus for the night. That's your <laughs> 10 points to Gryffindor. Yeah, we're all giant nerds here. It's, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Um, yeah, do I you know, put any of these other colors in here? I'm Darth now. Can I get in there? So sure, good idea. Red lightsaber. It's almost pink, which is kind of fun for me. Yeah, the color looks great, man. I mean... Thanks. Uh, so uh, how many questions did we miss? I was doing a lot of talking. No, no. I mean, they simmered down. I think people were just paying attention. I got feedback of like, awesome. And this cool. is relaxing the watch. And this is super helpful and things of that nature. I think awesome. there's, uh, quite a few people that um, also it's like, you know, midnight over on the East Coast. We, we lost a few folks here. Uh, just right. Now, but absolutely. Um, but all in all, man, I, I would just tell you, thank you so much for your time tonight. I mean, it's been amazing. Uh, any final words you want to sign off on here with the with the students? And I'll just continue to continue to emphasize, send me an email. Uh, the number one thing we could do is set up a time to talk so that we can help you to explore the school, look at different options. There's people asking questions about online, on site, how things will work. So I just continue to, to echo, like, I really want to help you out. There's so much to explain. So just reach out. Uh, well, let me hand it back to you. Any, any last words for you for the students that are hanging in there watching? Yeah, now's a good time. Um, uh, now's a really good time for a lot of reasons. Um, things have been gotten, getting tough all around the world, but the one industry that's skyrocketing is uh, animation and games. Um, companies are going full steam ahead. People are dying for content. So it's one of the industries that's really growing right now. Um, uh, there's a few, there's a few new kind of like megalithic companies that have kind of risen, um, you know, Netflix being one of the big leaders. And when you look at a show like Love, Death and Robots on Netflix, which is like a variety show of animated shorts, that means there's no surefire way that's going to make a lot of money, draw a lot of people. They're just interested in investing in the art. When a studio, when people start doing that, that's when it's a good time for our industry. Um, the last time I remember that happening was in the nineties, uh, with shows like liquid television, and, uh, uh, things like that. Um, and not only is it a good time for our industry, um, uh, where people are looking for artists a lot more right now uh, to fund all the, you know, to, to, to fill roles in all these projects, 
Um, Zoom has been an interesting thing. We're all realizing the advantage that we've had of this. Um, I now Zoom, I set up a live Zoom each week with my online students that they can attend if they so choose. It's, it's, it's an option. Um, and so I'm getting a lot more face time with online students as well, once you can't make it all the way out here. And, uh, you know, we get questions like, is this going to change the state of the industry? Is the industry going to necessarily require to be in LA or wherever these days? And that's a good question. If the answer is it's going to be a lot more negotiable now. And uh, with school and with us having to kind of pivot over, we've always been looking ways to increase our ability to connect with students online. And this was a crash course and having to do that because we were doing it for on-site students and then realized we could take a lot of these techniques and just carry them right over to the online uh, stuff too. So um, uh, this would be, this is one of the best times to be teaching and being an artist that it seems like it would be to kind of dig in. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. And yeah, it's yet to be seen what the impact is going to be on the industry, but I would, I would totally agree with you that not just the art and design community, but pretty much all communities are starting to see that there are a lot of ways to, to work cohesively, even without everybody in the same building. So this is, you know, there's definitely some good coming out of this as well with just, I'd see companies being more open-minded to remote work or working, you know, collaboratively, collaboratively, like from different locations. So, uh, but anyway, Hey, so uh, in the chat, if you want to send one last big, thank you. Great job here to the start of the show, Mr. Jeremy please do so now so he gets a chance to see all of that. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President. We do these events all the time. There's a ton of different events that we're going to be doing. Uh, I'll drop the link really quickly. So if anybody wants to check out any of the upcoming events, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we do events like this every single Tuesday, pretty much every single Tuesday. Some once in a while we have a week off, but mostly every Tuesday. There's a variety of other events that are out there. So please check out that link here. I'm going to drop it a couple times just so it doesn't get lost in the thread. And the last thing I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and throw out my email once again. Anybody out there that wants to explore the school, whether you're international or domestic, if you are looking for undergraduate school, graduate school, or even if you're still in high school and you're looking to take courses, we do have a program for students that are in high school that is free. So please reach out to me. I'll be happy to set you, uh, or at least uh, get you started off on the right foot and uh, set up some time to go over things with you. So uh, send me an email as soon as you can. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and sign off here. I want to say uh, not just thank you to Jeremy and Nicholas for their time, but all the people behind the scenes, Mr. John Beeson, online education, Scott, Maruf, uh, the marketing team, everybody out there that helps put these things on. Thank you all so much. Students, most important, thank you for your time tonight and being here. We love spending our nights with you. Uh, we hope you had a good time and learned a lot. I got to tell you, I was digging the artwork. Uh, I, I thought the color man was awesome at the end too. It was a really strong way to finish. So thank you so much for your time, Jeremy. And students, be safe out there. Hopefully we'll see you all here again soon. Thank you, guys. And we can go ahead and end the recording here. I'll just hang back for any last second questions. If anybody needs an extra link, I'll send it over. If not, we'll close out the room here in, a, in about a minute.